Hello everyone, I, thanks for joining in Astro 322 today. I am sorry to be a little scattered. I am in a review panel this week, which means I'm reading a bunch of applications and then we're getting together to discuss them. And so what that means is I'm sort of hopping back and forth uh, between those things. Uh, I just wanted to get started with a few logistical notes uh, that you may be aware of. Uh, first is that uh, homework one has been returned, I think, so you should see grades visible on eClass uh, now, uh, and it's come back and you should be able to go into assign two. Uh, this is as always my first time using these tools. So if I have set up some sort of, you know, stupid, uh, error, then, uh, we might have, uh, you know, some problems. So let me know if you have issues here, uh, by far. Fantastic work on homework one. I think the result that I'm really concerned, uh, the result that may concern you is that you may have forgotten your acknowledgements. And if you do, you lost 20% on this. Uh, trust me, it's a mistake that people only ever make once. So I, yeah, you're, um, yeah, it, 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 it's usually something that will come back. Starting in homework three, I remember to just put a specific blank in the assign two uh, for your acknowledgements upload, which should serve as a good prompt there. So just, I uh, remember that homework two, which doesn't have that blank is due on Friday. And then homework three is posted and available and is due the following Friday. Thanks for all the great questions that have been coming in on uh, the discord about how the homework is perceived. Feel free to ask me uh, and stress, uh, you can DM me on discord for homework content questions. It's when you start to be like, why did I get a minus six points off here? That's fine. And the nice thing about assign two is I can just go and look at your work. If you're like, hey, could you take a look at my, you know, solution here? I think this is what I was going for and the grader didn't quite get it. I can go ahead and take a look at that. So there are some advantages to the online tools there. Uh, so uh, I, I'm into it. Um, anyways, for this Friday, we'll be spending part of the session uh, discussing sections one through three of the Gaia article in more detail. Uh, so we'll be splitting into small groups and you all can chat and kind of come up with answers to uh, your uh, to sort of an e-class uh, participation exercise uh, that we'll do there. So uh, go ahead and read the what's been posted on e-class, that article, read sections one through three of it, and then uh, I'll ask you some questions about it and we'll sort of discuss the content of that. Okay, that's my initial spiel. You got any questions? Yeah, Rockin, go ahead. Yeah. I tried to suppress that. Uh, for some reason, the Yuja video content tool has grades in it. I think it's because when you're super fancy with Yuja, you can get, um, uh, like you can embed quizzes in your lecture videos and then get scores off of them. So I think that's what it is. Answer, ignore. I really tried to hide that. So uh, yeah, well, yeah, I don't. Ignore it. Uh, I'll try to make it go away. All right. Hearing nothing. Today we're talking more about stars. Um, and the essential stellar physics that we want to talk about is this equation state. So we'll go through and today uh, we'll just sort of lay out what the basic physics of stars are for the purposes of this class. Um, when last we spoke, we were dealing with uh, these equations of state, uh, gas pressure, radiation pressure, degeneracy pressure. Uh, you did a problem where you were getting to know the gas pressure uh, formalism in terms of astrophysics. Uh, and we'll sort of think about these other two pressure uh, next. And I was going to just start out uh, with this epoll code. The, co the code is JID. And I want to know what the, oops, what's the radiation pressure in a standard room? And uh, despite me updating my slides, I didn't actually update the relevant equations here. Uh, so what we care about here is actually the radiation pressures. P rad is four thirds sigma SB, that's the Seth and Boltzmann constant over C times T to the fourth. And since you might not have learned the Stefan Boltzmann constant by heart yet, that's 5.67 times 10 to the minus eight watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. So take that away uh, and we'll set that up. <laughs> 
Oops, that's definitely not the button I meant to press. How about that button? That's a great button. So yeah, go ahead and press, uh, put that in there. Looking for an answer in Pascal's. We got an answer already. All right, so we're getting some answers in here. I'll sort of do a little setup while you're finishing up. issues that you have to remember as you're grappling with this is first that the temperature has to be in Kelvin. So that 17 degrees Celsius has to convert over to add 273 to it to get to 290 Kelvins. Uh, and then you might have to remember what speed of light is. But if you stick all of that in, I get an answer that was 1.8 times 10 to the minus 6 uh, Pascal's. Let's see how I did against uh, the uh, answers that came in. Did anybody get that too? Oh yeah, we got a few. We got a few. I like it. All right. So the relevant number here is that the um, uh, 1.8, this is a micro Pascal, uh, which is very different from a gas pressure here. So just remember that the atmospheric pressure is about 10 to the 5 Pascals uh, from gas. So this may not surprise you that on a day that is warmer, you are not completely crushed by radiation pressure, uh, but it does scale like temperature to the fourth power. Uh, and so what that means is that in stars where the temperatures are not 290, but 2.9 million, the scaling can become uh, a lot higher. And so that extra pressure becomes far more important for stars than it does for gas. Um, getting ready to move on. Any questions on that? Seeing none. Hearing none. All right. Uh, the next thing I want to do is an example. Uh, this is kind of a fundamental example that I wanted to talk through. It's worked through in your book as well. So uh, with uh, more words, but less animation. The question is, what's the approximate average temperature in the sun if it's supported by gas pressure? And you may recall that the what I laid out last time is that there's something in a star that has to provide pressure support. There's kind of a requirement that if this thing isn't going to collapse, there's got to be pressure inside it. And so uh, if there's, uh, that means that the magnitude of pressure that we need, P required, is equal to P gas. So we basically say there's a need, which is how much gra uh, pressure is required to support against gravity, versus how much pressure we have from whatever the gas temperature is. And so the get required pressure, this is very much a uh, astronomer's derivation. 
which is I'm just I'm going to ignore prefactors. All the values are there, so there's basically the details. Uh, and so this is normally the thing that you would call from hydrostatic equilibrium. That's where the equation comes from. But you can derive this order of magnitude estimate of this. So I'm probably calling this an equality is generous. Let's give it a little sim, which is just like an equal sign, but we're being, uh, you know, we're being horrible with uh, equation with uh, constants. Anyways, we want to compare that to the gas pressure, which is nKT. But what is N for the sun? Well, we don't really know, but we know it's mostly made of hydrogen and that it, it has a mass M and a radius R, where those are values that I'll give to you in a second. So we can make an estimate that the number of density of particles in the sun is the mass over the, so uh, let's actually, let me, let me break this up into two steps rather than just writing it down in one. So first, I know that the number density is the total number of particles big N over the volume. The total number of particles big N is basically the mass of the star divided by the mass of a particle. And so I'm going to say that that's the solar mass divided by the hydrogen mass. M sun over mh. So that basically would give me how many particles there are in the sun. Then I'm going to divide it by uh, the volume of the star. And the volume of the star, I'm going to assume that it's a cube of radius, uh, a cube of edge length r. Not actually the shape of a star, but you know, constants. Who cares? Uh, okay, so then this gives us something that we can solve for in terms of the observed properties of the stars. And again, because I'm ignoring constants, I'm going to be off by a factor of several, but it gives us a good order of magnitude estimate. So I'm going to stick that value in here and say that gm squared over r to the fourth is of order m sun over mh times 1 over r cubed. And then the rest of the gas law here comes in. K uh, times t. Now I'm going to solve for t. That's what I actually care about. So I'm going to get that t, and this is the cool part about it. We're going to do some canceling. That r cubed cancels with r, three powers there, leaving behind an r. One of these masses cancels with that mass. Uh, that goes there, and then we can solve for the temperature here. And so I get that the temperature is g m little m over r times k. And so that's the estimate of the particle. Uh, and actually, you can squint at this. If I put the K on the other side, you see KT. That's the thermal energy of a particle. And then the other one is G, big M, little m over R. That's the gravitational potential energy of a particle. So there's kind of another argument that you could put in there. But that gives us the sort of scope of the... Uh, um, the scope of the measurement. And now it's all over but inserting some numbers. So we say that the temperature is the gravitational constant. Let's see if I can squeeze this all in here without being horribly righty. Uh, 10 to the minus 11 meter cube per kilogram second squared uh, times the, oh, this is not going to work, um, times, I'll just do it down here, times uh, the solar mass, 1.99 times 10 to the 30 kilograms times 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. That's the mass of a hydrogen atom. All divided by the radius, which is 6.96 times 10 to the eighth meters times the Boltzmann constant, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin. And if I stick all of those numbers in, stick them into the mighty calculator, turn the crank up a little bit, I get an answer that's 2 times 10 to the 7 Kelvin. And if you do this with all the constants in, that's about a factor of 4 high for reasons that people who took Astro 320 should be extremely suspicious of. But uh, that gives you the typical temperature of the star that's required to support against the pressure. So basically, if the sun's supported by gas pressure and it hasn't collapsed into a black hole, it's got to be hot inside. And it's got to be kind of millions of Kelvin uh, inside. Oh, sorry. Did I get? Yeah. No, it's 2 times 10. 2 times 10 7. Or 2 times 10 to the 6. I'm going to scroll up and make sure I got that right. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. Eh, it's gone. All right. I think it's 2 times 10 to the 7 Kelvin. Yeah, so it's a little high because I think 5 million is the actual temperature. Actually, let's look here. So if you do the full crazy analysis of the uh, sun 
full stellar model, stick everything in there. Um, you get this temperature profile that I'm showing you here. So this uh, shows the graph of the temperature. This is R over the solar radius. This is T over 10 to the sixth Kelvin. So our estimate is up here. So that's, we just estimated that. Clearly not quite right, but it's on the right order of magnitude. And so the internal temperature of the sun on average is about 10 million Kelvin. Uh, but when we talk about the temperature of the sun, it's the effective temperature, and that's 5777 Kelvin. So that's the surface temperature of the sun, which is basically the gra what your graph goes down to out here. And the reason why these two things are different is that the sun has a outer layer. I was thinking about this while walking the dog this morning, that I was nice and warm inside my uh, jacket, but then the outside of my jacket, which is kind of the outside layers of the sun, they're really cold because I was watching the frost form on it as I breathed. Uh, and so that's the difference here is that the, we have these insulating layers uh, between uh, the tight, warm engine inside the whatever, the star or the person inside the jacket. And then you have these insulating layers so that the radiation takes time to leak out. And that's why jackets keep you warm is they stop your thermal radiation from leaking out into the environment. Uh, and so it keeps you warm. So you're losing energy just at a slower rate. And that's the same thing that's happening with stars. They have all of this high internal temperatures that they're generating energy, but then they're losing that energy as their outer parts cool off into space. So stars have a more extreme version. They're way hotter in, hotter in the inside, and then they are leaking radiation out into uh, space, which is colder on the outside. So, you know, if you think Edmonton is bad, you could be a star in space. But stars in space uh, get their energy very differently. They do not have to, in my case, eat horrible breakfasts uh, and then produce their energy that way. They produce their energy through nuclear fusion. And uh, nuclear fusion is basically this process by which we take nucleons, you know, protons and neutrons, smash them together into and have them bind together into a strong nuclear force. And when you t uh, put them together, light elements together, you release energy. This graph here is one of the fundamental physics uh, graphs or relations that informs astrophysics. This is called the binding energy per nucleon curve, and it indicates how much energy is released when I fuse together light nucleons into an atomic uh, nucleus of mass number A. So that's total number of protons plus the total number of neutrons. And you notice it has this weird structure. So for reference, if you down here at one, that's not on this graph, but that's just you know a proton sitting there or a neutron sitting there. That is something that is not bound together in any form. But when I stick the that like a proton together with a neutron, that would make this particle called deuterium. And what that says is if I go from an isolated proton into an is and an isolated neutron together, this would release this much energy. It would go up here and it would release one mega electron volt. And so for reference, remember that one MeV is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. And so that's, uh, you may remember the like you know, minus 19 and the difference is just the mega versus the regular electron volt. And I always remember with the O2, you only need to know it to three significant figures. Okay, so this says that if I stick together those two particles, I get a one MeV gamma ray kicks out from the nuclear fusion. That's pretty cool. And what the stars are doing is they are fusing their hydrogen and uh, particles here all the way up to helium. So that's the standard nuclear fusion process in the stars as you release here. And that releases seven mega electron volts of energy per particle in there. So actually I should have said that with a deuterium, it would release two MeV because I'm sticking together two nucleons. I made a mistake there. But I stick a proton and a neutron together, two nucleons come together, releases uh, all together one MeV per nucleon. So that's two nucleons all together. Okay, so we get seven MeV of energy released when I stick these particles together, and uh, that's the energy that keeps the star warm. That's basically all it's doing is keeping the star warm. Um, 
So we can use this to do things like estimate how much energy is released through nuclear fusion in uh, the sun. So we can ask, what's the full reservoir of energy that's available uh, for the star? And in a, in a star, we know that the nuclear fusion happens in the core, and so this also restricts the amount of fuel that's available for the uh, star. So that me and you know for reasons that are not part of this class so much as this class is like see see other things we teach but for reasons um, the amount of mass that's available in the sun is 0.13 solar masses or 13 percent of the solar of the uh, of the solar mass and then we have these mass fractions which I uh, went over last time which is the mass fraction of hydrogen helium and metals. So the hydrogen mass fraction is this x and that mean this and this is why we express things as mass fraction x you're about to see is it makes this type of calculation super easy. So what we want to do is how much energy could we get out of a uh, nuclear fusion process uh, for the sun. So we look at this binding energy per nucleon curve and we see that we get 7 MeV per nucleon out and so to calculate the total amount of energy, I would just basically find out the number of nucleons available, n, nuke, and I would multiply that by E binding per nucleon. And so I know that the binding energy per nucleon here is just, the, from the graph, 7 MeV per nucleon. So that's uh, the basic scale that we're working with. Then we have to figure out the number of nucleons in the star. Well, turns out that's really close to the value that we just calculated out uh, for the um, uh, thermal energy estimate that we did uh, a couple slides back. So the number of nucleons uh, that are available, we're gonna be a little more precise about this and we're gonna be blue. Uh, so that is the amount of mass that's available. Not the whole mass, just this 0.13 solar masses. So that is the uh, is basically going to be 0 0.13 solar masses, which is the available there. And of that, not all of that is hydrogen. In fact, only X of it is hydrogen. So that 0.72, we'd multiply that and that would give us the amount of uh, matter that's in hydrogen or the amount of mass that's in hydrogen. And then we would divide by the hydrogen mass, which we approximate as the mass of the proton, basically the, the same, you know, electrons only contribute particles, not mass. And then that gives me the total number of nucleons. And then I multiply by this uh, binding energy per nucleon. And then it's all over, but sticking in some numbers. So it's 0 0.13 uh, times 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms times x, which is 0 0.72 times 7 MeV per nucleon. And from there, uh, I divide that by the mass of the hydrogen atom. 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And that gives me a large number of MeVs, but I'm going to take this whole mass and I'm going to multiply it by a conversion factor because I don't really have a great sense of stellar astrophysics in terms of MEVs. I always remember it in terms of joules. And uh, we multiply that by the aforementioned 1.602 times 10 to the negative 13. So we know that this answer is coming out in MEV. So we want MEV in the basement so that it cancels out. Then we multiply by aforementioned conversion factor. I'm going to drop the 2 this time because it's not like I'm remembering it. Uh, 10 to the minus 13 joules. And we twiddle this all out. We end up with... Um, uh, right, it was, oh, I have the answer over here, 1.25, 1.3, let's call it, because, you know, putting it to three significant figures would be like what we call in the business a lie, uh, times 10 to the 14, 10 to the 44 joules. Okay, this is an interesting number to me, uh, and it will be to you really soon, because this is the characteristic energy scale of a supernova explosion. 
So basically the sun's nuclear energy is basically the same amount of energy that goes off in a supernova explosion. Supernova explosion takes a few days to go off and dump all its energy into the surrounding medium. Uh, the sun does it over the course of 10 billion years. So it's uh, kind of a difference in scales. Questions on that calculation? Getting text notification. So the question is, the 7 MeV is the binding energy uh, going from hydrogen to helium. Yes, it's the binding energy per nucleon. So if I release and I actually bind the high, zero up to the seven heliums, the total amount of energy released is about 28 MeV, uh, a little lower because of some inefficiencies in the exact reaction chain that come out. But that's the, you know, the whole fusion for hydrogen into one helium gives me about 28 MeV. Uh, so that's, you know, and it's, so that's four particles. So four times seven equals 28. So to capitalize upon that, uh, I'm going to ask you, later in the sun's life, it's going to fuse helium into carbon, which for the reference is right here. That's helium, oops, that's not right there. That's helium into carbon. Uh, so get a good look on that and see what the kind of energy uh, scales are gonna be. And I want you to go through and estimate uh, Try it in joules uh, to figure out how much energy that would be created by heat fusing the helium into the carbon in the center of the sun. And here you can use that mass and then note that once we are fusing helium to carbon, all the hydrogen is gone. So we have y equals 0.98 and then the metallicity z equals 2. I'll jot down a few other useful things and let the e poll go. This is hard.
All right, I'm gonna come along and do a little setup here. Uh, the number of nucleons here is the mass in the core multiplied by the mass fraction, that's helium. So that'll give us everything but the metals. And then I divide that by mH because we're sort of coming up with the number of nucleons in the environment. There's going to be a slight difference, sort of 1% variation, but if, you know, we've reached this point in Astro 322 and realize that we are, you know, sort of, you know, really just doing some order of magnitude scalings, then we won't, you know, be as concerned. So we get the number of nucleons that way. They're all packaged up into helium atoms, but that doesn't matter. We care about the number of nucleons there. Then we multiply by the difference here. And the difference is, I estimated that as about 0.7 MeV per nucleon. So maybe 0.6, your mileage may vary, but I just sort of read that off of the graph to figure out how much energy was coming out per nucleon. And then if I scale that all out, I get a value uh, that is uh, 1.7 times 10 to the 43 joules, which is a, about a factor of 10 less than the value that we saw before, which was uh, compare to there to 1.4 times 10 to the oh, 1.2, 1.2 times 10 to the 44. or from before. So this is essentially saying that the fusion of hydrogen to helium, lots of energy comes out, but later stages of stellar evolution do not have quite the fuel reservoir. Uh, borrowing on our sort of uh, human analogy that I was thinking about a lot this morning, this is a lot like, you know, you have the kilocalories per gram of fat versus the kilocalories per gram of carb or whatever, you know, four or four versus nine or whatever. Basically, hydrogen to helium fusion is the most efficient uh, source of energy for the stars. The later stages of nuclear burning produce progressively diminishing returns. They're lower and lower efficiency. And as you look at this curve, it rises up, 12 carbon uh, getting uh, some e extra fusion up to 18 uh, or 16 oxygen, 34 sulfur, neon is somewhere along that curve there, gets visited. It gets progressively less and less efficient up to the binding energy per nucleon peak, which is at 56 iron. So that's the most tightly bound nucleus. And that's sort of the end of the state at which nuclear fusion is exothermic and can provide energy. And remember, a star essentially sets up the amount of fusion it goes through based on the need to support itself in terms of gas pressure. So this is what supports the, it basically it says, I have to produce energy. So it's going to burn through its fuel uh, however fast it needs to in order to provide the thermal energy uh, that the thermal energy that's required to support it. Otherwise, it collapses, heats up, and moves on to a later stage of burning, if possible. Okay, um, any questions about that? I've only got my Zoom questions up. Okay, yeah, Discord questions, also quiet. Audio questions, who's got them? Closing the e-poll soon. All right. I want to see how we do. Yeah, okay, cool. Right. Not a, a reasonably good set of answers. Okay, um, next thing to talk about is basically we, we take this essential physics and this gives us the observed properties of stars. Like what, you know, when you sort of solve this system and march everything out, what do you learn about the properties of stars? And here we are essentially hoovering up a bunch of the astrophysics knowledge that we uh, can work out and sort of spitting it out into, this is what we need to know. Now we're into the stars are a black box. We don't know what's happening inside them kind of view of the world. The critical thing that is non-trivial to deduce is what's called the mass luminosity relationship, which basically says, if I have a star of an initial mass, um, M, what's its luminosity? How much energy does it produce while it's on the main sequence? And so when something is on the main sequence, that's referring to the hydrogen fusing into helium in the core. 
Those are the two things that have to be true for a star uh, to be on the main sequence. And very approximately, they follow a power law relationship, which says a star has, you know, one solar luminosity times the mass of that uh, mass over a solar mass raised to the 3.5. Stick one into this equation, you get one to the 3.5 times one, and you get, so a one solar mass star has one solar luminosity. Not quite always true. We'll learn that the sun will vary from sort of 0.7 to about 1.4 solar luminosities over the course of its lifetime. But, you know, one. That's about right. Uh, so that's good. Uh, the relationship on the right is a log-log plot of the uh, mass versus the luminosity. And you'll see that this dashed line, uh, this red dashed line that we have here, is not quite perfect. In fact, it sort of breaks down at the high mass end, and maybe the low mass end's a little crappy, and it's not as steep as it needs to be here in the middle. So we use this thing, uh, in some cases, like homeworks and stuff, would, we would use this thing called the composite relationship, which breaks this up up into a piecewise relationship where you can sort of say, okay, what's the um, solar, uh, the luminosity coming out for a star of different uh, mass? And it breaks it up into this domain where we sort of figure out these different parts of the power law and you just sort of pick what domain you're on and stick in the mass. And so why don't you try that out? Just, you know, see how a, uh, Scaling works for a 1.5 solar, uh, sorry, 15 solar mass star. So the question came up, oops, I think I made it go away. What's the dot after 126 for that value? Uh, that dot here is just a decimal place. And when you stick a decimal place at the end of the number there, it's just an indication of the precision of it. Usually you use it just for zeros because that's implied. I just stuck it in there. All of it, it's just sort of indicating what values are significant. Yeah, you're right. I probably should take that out. gone. Okay, uh, so let's see how we're doing. All right, we got tons of answers. I love it, uh, except we don't like that color. That's a bad color to choose. Uh, great. Let's, uh, so uh, 15 solar mass, you just pick which branch of the equation it's in. So it's in the bottom branch. So then we just say that this is 126 times 15 solar masses over one solar mass raised to the 2.0 power, also known to all the people in the house as squaring. And you do that as you get 2.8 times 10 to the four solar luminosities. 2.8 times 10 to the four, yep. All right, uh, closing things out. We get, uh, see how we doing. One, two, 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 two. Oh, people totally scaled this all out. Yeah, all right. Uh, you know, I think some people converted this all the way into uh, watts, which is also an excellent answer. Uh, 
All you got to remember is that in an exam context, if it doesn't have units on it, I'm going to have a bad time. And then if I have a bad time, you're going to have a bad time. Okay, uh, but yeah, so the TLDR on this is that at 15 solar masses, things are, you know, it's only a little bit more massive than the sun, but it's 10,000 times as radiant or 20, 30,000 times uh, the amount of luminosity. And so what that means is that you can sort of think about these stars as sort of going through their fuel at different rates. And this is one of the truisms of stellar astrophysics that's going to stick with us for this entire course. Namely, this implies the amount of time that the stars will be on the main sequence. Um, and so you can say, if we know what the main sequence lifetime of the sun is, then we can scale that by these two factors. You say that the main sequence lifetime of a star is going to be proportional to its mass, which is the amount of fuel available in its fuel tank. And on average, only about 10% of the mass is available in the core. We used 13 earlier, sort of the more precise number for the sun. And then we have uh, the, that's the amount of fuel we have. And then the luminosity represents how quickly it's going through the fuel. All the stars on the main sequence using the same fuel source. So they're using this hydrogen to helium fusion. And so that's basically going to get the same amount of energy per unit mass fused. And therefore the luminosity is a proxy for the rate at which that fusion is happening. And so we divide that through. So I think about, you know, the mass is the gas tank and the luminosity is basically the miles per gallon or the, you know, fuel economy of the star. And the, you know, these high mass stars are just burning through their fuel at an absurd rate to get through each unit of time. And if you stick in the scalings um, in full detail, you get a coarse <coughs> relationship. This, you know, sticking in the L goes like... Uh, as I stick in L proportional to the mass to the 3.5 power, this little fishy symbol right here, that just means proportional to. I've dropped all the constants out of it. All I'm showing is the relevant physical variables and their powers. So if you see the little fishy symbol, proportional to. Uh, and so I should erase that arrow because it's confusing in the broader context. Okay, so you stick in those values, you see that the sun is going to last about 10 billion years or 10 gig years or 10 to the 10 years. And there's a derivation of that in the book. And then the main sequence lifetime is going to scale like the minus 2.5 power. High mass stars, short lived on the main sequence. So if you see a high mass star, you know it was formed recently. The shortest lifetime on stars, this relationship kind of breaks down because of that composite relationship, not, not even being fully accurate. The shortest lifetime is about three mega years. Um, so that's three million years. And uh, the other thing is, is, if we go to lower mass stars, say 0.9 solar mass and lower, their main sequence lifetimes get long, longer than 14 billion years. And 14 billion years is the uh, implied age of the universe given our observations. So if we see stars that are less than 0.9 solar masses, they won't undergo any evolution off of the main sequence just because the universe hasn't been around long enough for them to do so. So this gives us some uh, bounding context here. Our sun is about 4.6 billion years old, uh, given uh, all the lines of evidence we have for that. So that sort of parks it right in the middle of its main sequence lifetime. 46% through. The other observed properties of stars, uh, we now delve fully into uh, observational astronomy um, uh, choices. Yeah, they were choices that were made. Um, so first is the properties of stars and what we call their spectral type. Uh, and the spectral types were developed not by uh, any sort of key physical properties of the stars, but rather based on their spectral lines. So if we look at the spectra of stars, and these are stars drawn from the Pickles catalog, only which is uh, something I only like because I really like saying the word Pickles in a scientific context. So the Pickles catalog goes ahead and uh, makes plots of all these uh, stellar spectra, and you see that the lines vary. So when we talk about a line, we're talking about stuff like this. These little lines here in these uh, whatever types of stars these are, they're strong. But if I look down here in these other types of stars, those lines are gone. And so there's absorption lines. And when they're really prominent, we say they're strong lines. And then when they're weaker, uh, they go away. Uh, so 
back in the day, people didn't know much about stars. So they essentially took all the spectra that they could and sorted them. These stars look together. We'll call that, uh, they look like they have common spectral features. We'll call that mm, type A. Oh, here's some things that also look different. Sort of like type A, but maybe a little different. Here's type B, uh, then C, then they worked all the way on. And they came up with a list of stars that was later realized to be a temperature sequence. And so we have this um, uh, sort of classic spectral uh, type sequence that we'll occasionally have to slip into, where we'll talk about the properties of stars as being in temperature sequence OBAFGKM. Uh, Olaf bring a fatted gelfling killed mercilessly, or whatever um, mnemonic you happen to have in your head. Um, we'll figure that out. What you may not have seen earlier is that there are actually three additional spectral types that have come into prominence lately called L, T, and Y. The reason why we usually stop at M is that's the last star. L, T, Y represent brown dwarfs, which are essentially stars that didn't get massive enough to enter onto the main sequence. And so what we do is we uh, take these spectral types and we further classify them or break them down into a numerical sequence. So a G star star is broken into G0, G1, G2, G3, whatever. Uh, and so there's a sequence here that sort of spans a full temperature and we just put these letter codes associated with it. So the, this is the temperature order. O is the hottest, M is the coolest star, L, T, Y are progressively cooler dwarf, uh, cooler brown dwarfs, and they're based entirely on their atmospheres, so their stellar spectrum. We don't have to know the shape of the spectrum, we just have to know the strength of the lines within the spectrum. And I think I'll pause there for questions. Anyone got questions? <gasps> Somebody's posting the homework discussion. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, so the question came up. Uh, it's all good. Um, the question came up: What is the what happens you know to this sort of scaling relationships for main sequence lifetimes and stuff like that if the proportion of the core is relatively smaller? And this kind of ten percent number that I quoted here is one of those sort of truisms that falls out of doing the full stellar physics. Is that there's the it's kind of a homology relationship, and there are cases where the amount of fuel that's available isn't this sort of ish ten percent of the star. Star. But for example, low mass stars like 0.4 and under are completely convective. And so they can actually access all of their material into stars. Uh, and some stars end up uh, going through their cycle and able to access a larger fraction, sort of 40% of their mass just based on the structure. But this 10% is an approximate number that gives us a good range and sense of scaling through here. And part of the reasons why our estimates break down is that that mass fraction is different for the highest mass stars versus the medium mass stars. But these are all approximate, give you a sense of it relationships. All right, we're calling it now. I got to go back to uh, criticizing things um, and trying to come up with the best science possible for the future. And you've got uh, guy articles to read, homeworks to do, and you know, your lives to lead. So have a great day. Uh, 48, uh, 47 hours, and I'll see you on Friday.